This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is the Citadel Cafe, episode number 321 for Wednesday, June 12th, 2019. My name is Joel Duggan, and the Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we are into. Joining me this week, as he often does, Mr. Lou Page, co-host of A Zombies Ate My Podcast, and at Busy Zombie Lord, all the social media that matters. Welcome back, my friend. Thank you for having me. This is going to be exciting. It is, because uh, of all the people that I talk to on uh, the Citadel Cafe, I mean... I would say Meg- Megan's a big video game person. She liked, uh, I can't remember the name of the one that she liked. It had androids in it, and she was going on about it for quite some time. It was a very good game. Uh, Detroit Become Human, I think. Yep. Um, anyway, so she plays games, but we don't often talk about games because uh, I usually don't much have much time to talk about uh, anything other than Minecraft, and I have a whole other podcast <laughs> that I do for that because I'm usually, my schedule only allows really for one game kind of in my life in terms of what the hours that I can I can put into it I can't say that (laughs) well see here's the thing I I don't I don't get sucked into episodic games I get sucked into things like World of Warcraft or Minecraft or you know MMOs like things that just are ongoing they don't stop you know like I have played in the past things like you know Assassin's Creed Black Flag and love them but like when I was playing it, that was the only thing that I could play until it was done. And then I could move, like, I, I didn't have time to have multiple different, different titles going. But anyway, the reason why I bring that up is because you are the other person on the podcast that I talk to that is very into, into video games on a regular basis. And I, I, I should say this. It was, I, it was, it was discovered by me this week, or actually it was last week, that I'm a video game pl- gamer. I play, I have almost 15,000 games on Steam. Really? Um, wow. Yeah, it it, I, it it 1500, sorry. 1500. I have 50 I have almost 1500 games on Steam. Yeah. Uh and I should say right now, I had a coworker uh who's somebody I know and they're big into games and I haven't t- ran, talked to him in years. Run into him in the office and he goes, "Oh, what are you playing now?" and I went and I ran off a list of weird indie games. <laughs> he went, "Oh, you're one of those people." <laughs> and I went and I went and I went, "Yeah." And he went so you're not like playing Call of Duty? No. No. You're not playing Battlefield? No. You're not playing Fortnite? No. And he was like, all right, then I'm not going to understand what you're talking about. All right, yeah, uh-huh. And we nodded and we walked away. And I went, am I that weird? And no. Then, am I, 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 refreshing, maybe. Because see, the reason why I bring this all up, of course, for, for those of you that, that have been under a rock, is that E3 happened uh, this week. Uh, and there was a lot of gaming announcements and a lot of, stuff and i followed a, a chunk of it because of course i have to keep on top of what microsoft and moyang are doing for the spawn chunks podcast the, the show that i do about minecraft uh and there's been a couple of different reveals over the course of actually the last two weeks because uh wwdc happened with apple and there was a minecraft earth demonstration there and then minecraft dungeons was announced or not announced but they more details were given uh about minecraft dungeon at uh at e3 during the microsoft press conference and uh so i I, I'm into games. Like, I keep up on them. It's it's kind of like a grass is greener sort of thing. I'm like, oh, yeah, that looks really cool. That would be really fun to play if I ever had the time, which I never do, or access. That's my big problem is access because I don't have a PC. I have a Mac. And um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, so there's, there's there seemed to be. Now, I'm only kind of summarizing because between some of the other podcasts that I listen to, watching some of the announcements, some of the highlights, you know, reading a couple articles, etc., there doesn't seem to be anything that's really standing out so much as far as games go there's a lot of like not stunts but like well they're yeah they are they're they're publicity stunts they're pr stunts that are getting a lot of press like keanu reeves was on stage and that was cool Mm, but it doesn't really tell you anything about the game (laughs) did you see the trailer for that game i did see the trailer for that game but it's a cinematic trailer it tells you nothing 
Like uh, unfortunately, that's the bad part because they have playable demos on the show floor, and from what I've seen of that that game, it's going to be awesome. So, and this is the thing that I have not seen. I've not seen a lot of feedback from people that have gone to the floors. That's going to come, I think, in the next week when some of the other yeah. podcasts that I listen yeah. to, you'll have people come back and they'll record their episodes of like my experience on the floor. Uh, I follow uh, Jeff Kanata uh, online on Twitter and, and some of his shows, and he's a big VR guy. And I'm very curious about VR from a from an art perspective. And so I find that he being a, a champion of VR, granted, he he is very positive on all things VR uh, for the most part, but he, he's not afraid of giving like a you know a a, a concise review of something that's not up to right. snuff. But he's very excited about about the VR experience, and it seems to be getting to a point now where that technology seems to be rolling to to a place where you don't have to have cameras all around the room. They're putting the cameras in the headsets now. So, you know, the, in some places, I think it's the Oculus Quest where everything is just in the headset. Now, it's mobile processing. So it's essentially like mobile games. You're not going to be playing Call of Duty on it, I don't think. Yeah. Um, but uh, for my purposes or for just the, you know, I mean, you're talking about someone that really his only gaming experience in the last couple of years for the most part has been Minecraft. The graphics in Minecraft are not going to blow your mind. So, you know, having those kind of, a, of simple graphic experiences in VR is, is appealing to me. But um, so I thought that we would take a, a bit of time and talk about E3 and some of the things that might be standing out to us. Um, I unfortunately had to sit through the whole Microsoft conference. Which I'm is, sorry. Yeah. Well, and I don't normally do this because I know, I've learned long ago that it's all the same information from all the same developers. They all get up on stage. It's always the head of this or the head of that talking about this, that, and the other thing. The only thing I, I've, the only conferences that I've watched before that have been entertaining has been Nintendo. Um, but I feel like Nintendo have been around for so long and they just, they don't tend to feel like they have to throw their weight around. They just kind of get up and talk they about the games. Don't even, they don't even do a real conference. They literally do a video show. Yeah. 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 And I, I, I and I appreciate them for that. Yeah. No, because I mean the Microsoft conference, I think on YouTube was something like an hour and a half. I mean, it, wasn't bad it wasn't like it was hard to watch it was just a lot of anytime that somebody was talking or on stage they literally had nothing to say it was like yeah. there was all this pomp and circumstance for nothing you know like i mean if i learned anything it's like gamers are gamers that like gaming with their gamer friends it's like well thank you einstein i think, I think it's a telling thing that activision didn't do a press conference um i don't think uh Activision didn't do a press conference. Uh, Sony did not do a press conference. And there's a third one that didn't do a press conference. And I think it's a telling thing that people are not doing press conferences. Yeah, I, uh, I know what uh, you mean. I'm trying to think about that third developer because I that was. I want to say it's. I want to say it's EA, but I'm not. I don't think it is. No, there was an EA thing because I remember. There was an EA thing, but I. Because one of the comments was the lack of like endless sport titles. Yeah. It was a surprise. Usually you have a lot of sport titles with EA. Um, I don't yeah. think those are making them as much money as they used to. No. No, I don't imagine. Well, because it's just it just seems to be the same thing over and over again. And that yep. well, and that seemed that was my other takeaway was that it was difficult to get excited because in a lot of these games it's just it's just the same thing over and over again. Like yep. the I looked at some of the highlights from the Ubisoft you know conference. The Ubisoft conference was just nothing but Tom Clancy first person shooters. Which I mean, yep. I'm exaggerating, the, but but was, not really. No, it was it just it was very samey. Like and the, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, the only thing that excited me at the Ubisoft conference was Watchdog Legions, but I'm not sure they can deliver on what they're promising. Yeah, that they, was... They've done, they've done that with Watchdogs with me before, and I've gotten excited and then gotten burned, and I'm like, eh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and the thing is, like, and there seems to be a lot of that. They're like, are you excited? Yeah, we're excited. Okay, do you want a release date? Yeah, give us a release date. It's coming out in almost a year. Crickets. Like, just nothing it's like yeah the release date april 2020 uh okay now i'm not saying that that's necessarily bad that the release date is in 2020 because there's been a lot of you know news uh in the industry lately about burnout about uh people artists uh like myself you know being worked too hard underpaid undervalued at these studios and uh, in my opinion, there's even been some releases that I've been um, 
talking about, especially with, with Mojang and Minecraft, where it shows like the product is buggy, you know, things are not performing as they should. It's, it's, you're disappointed in what you've come to expect from a, a gaming company and developer that you, that you love. So I don't think pushing titles back is a bad thing. Uh, notably no. Minecraft Dungeons. We all thought it was coming out this year. It's now 2020, early 2020 is what they said. So again, if it's a good game, I don't mind the wait. The problem is with these conferences is they get someone like Keanu Reeves or, or, or another person up on stage and they get everybody all hyped up about like, we've got all this stuff to show you and it's, it's nothing. You just, you, they give you no information. A lot of times it's just, it's just a cinematic trailer and, yeah. and then there's a date that's a year away or more. It's just like, or there's no date at all. It's like, well, if you don't have anything to say, then why are you here? And it just, it seems, and it's like you said, like Sony doesn't have a press conference uh, and, and other developers are not doing it. And I think that in a lot of ways, there's so much hinging on, which is what I want to talk about, uh, the next generation of, of consoles. And I'm not a console gamer. I have an Xbox 360 that I bought secondhand off a friend. I think I've maybe started a couple hours into a second playthrough of Black Flag, but I've not bought any new games for the Xbox in a long time. Every now and again, I'm at a flea market and there'll be a guy that has a bunch of Xbox games for like five bucks. And I'll, I'll think about bringing something home, but ultimately I'm just like, meh, I don't have time to play it. So I'm not going to buy it, even if it's only five bucks. So, yeah. Uh, but what I've noticed uh, since I started streaming is that uh, I don't have access to the games that I want to play like Satisfactory, like Minecraft Dungeons, which is not coming to Mac. It's coming to everything else but Mac. Uh, and Minecraft is uh, something that is available on Mac with the Java edition. So it's one of those things where uh, I was curious to see what these next-gen consoles are going to be. And I thought, oh, Microsoft, or Microsoft said at the beginning of their at the, of the press conference, we're going to tell you stuff about the next-gen, what's coming next. And I thought, oh, okay, I'm interested in that. That sounds... Uh, because I know what they have to answer to with some of the other specs and other things that the industry is doing. And they said nothing. They said nope. it's going to be 40% faster than the current I, gen. Well, I should I, hope so. Like, I, it's going to be faster. It's going to be cooler. It's going to be better. It's going to be better, faster. It's, so what? Like that, why? Give me a price point. Give me, well, and then holiday 2020. It's like, well, okay. But if you so don't what? have a name for it now, like it's still Project Scarlet, I think is what they're yep. calling it. Yep, but that's exactly still, what's... But they couldn't tell me anything. And I think one of the things, one of the reasons why is because Microsoft is also pushing uh, uh, subscription services. And and this, I can't knock them because it's $10 a month or $14.99 a month. I can't remember which. Uh, but Xbox Game Pass or PC Game Pass, when, uh, I think it's PC Game Pass, um, similar to something like Netflix. Now, it's not as much content as Netflix, but there are a lot of games that you can get on to for your monthly subscription. And if that's the kind of experience that you're into and you do not care about owning the physical media, it's a steal. Like it, especially, um, I'm assuming there's going to be a lot of indie titles and stuff like that. That really does feel appealing to me. And it feels like an entry point where they're talking about, and I can't remember the name of it. It's Xbox streaming. No, something cloud X cloud X cloud. I uh, have no idea. I yeah. didn't catch this conference. X, X Cloud. It's it's their it's their answer to Google Stadia, which is the big elephant in the room. And and so this and this is what I feel and why I don't think um, there's been much said about these new consoles is because everybody's waiting for either Google Stadia to knock it out of the park and give them all a run for their money or it's fall not. flat on its face. Well, this is the thing. So, but the things that I'm hearing and seeing is, is a, are very positive for Google Stadia. Either way, if it, if it's more competition in the space, it's good for consumers. Yes, so I agree. I agree with that. Right. So, so this is the thing. I I feel like Microsoft is like we want and probably will announce a hardware console like a box you have to buy an Xbox that has to go on your TV. But we also have the technology and we're laying the groundwork to do a. Um, a cloud, you know, server uh, service uh, or both. Microsoft's, 
Microsoft's also doing something interesting because they, I, I when it comes to storefronts, I don't trust Microsoft. Um, I stopped buying Xbox games when when 360 died because mm. there was nothing on the Xbox One I didn't already own on PC, basically. Right. Mm-hmm. And and they couldn't and there wasn't enough first party titles to make me want to run out and buy a Xbox. Everything I wanted came to PC anyway. The only exception was Halo. And then what did they do? Microsoft announced earlier this year as many Halo games as they can are going to get pumped to X to, to Steam in the next six months. Mm-hmm. They're going to do the Master Chief Collection is coming to Steam like in like two months. And I'm like, great. Now I don't care. I, you're giving me more reason not to buy your stuff. Um, also, I got burned by the. Do you remember when they had the privacy breach? Uh, oh yes, a couple yeah. years ago. Yep. Mm-hmm. I got burned by that, and it permanently uh, hurt my gamer tag account to the point where I can't log in anymore. Right. So. And and for me to call, it's tied to an email address I haven't had in twenty years. And it's literally like, oh, yeah, if you want to do anything with your account, we're sorry. We can't prove that you're you. And I'm like, great, thanks. Mm. And so for me, Microsoft, anything they have to say, I kind of watch with a grain of salt. Uh, They did games for Windows Live, and that's what uh, Fallout 3 on PC was with. And two or three other games were part of this games for Windows Live thing. And those games now don't work on regular modern PCs. Because they did away with games for Windows Live, and they never updated those game. They never had those games updated, so they work without games for Windows Live. So those games are now broken for me. Yeah. And I bought them years ago. And so Microsoft does this thing where they do something, and then it doesn't work, and then they abandon it, and then the people that did invest in it get burned. And because of that, I just, I just can't get excited about them anymore. Yeah, there seems to be some steps, and unfortunately, mm-hmm. I. I can't recall everything they said, but there seems to be some steps in terms of cross-platform saving. Uh, and They've done that for years. Yeah, and I mean, it depends on the title and, and depends on... Um, like Destiny was a big one where like you could you could bring your saves and your characters you know, across to different platforms and things, and I thought that was cool. Um, it's, there's a lot of questions, and nothing is very clear as far as you know right. the services and stuff go, but... Because uh, because uh, true to form, like true to Microsoft form, it's very it's very like they've got a different freaking name for everything. Because there's there's like Xbox, what's the service? It's, it's um, I just said it a minute ago. There's X, not Xbox Live. It's Xbox. There's X Cloud, which is something different, and then there's PC. The, uh, there's there's game 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 yeah, sub PC oh. Game Pass Game Pass Game Pass Game Pass. So Xbox Game Pass and PC Game Pass are not the same thing, but there's a nope. there's an X Pass Ultimate or something that is the same thing where you combine them both and it's like an extra five bucks. So there there seems to be something for the hardcore gamers if you really dig, uh, but then the average person, the the casual gamer, which is what I would call myself, uh, it's very confusing from the outside. Um, I, what, what I honestly think they're trying to sell to a market that doesn't exist. Yeah, well, cause, um, and, and this is the thing, because the, the, it's one of those kind of confusing but interesting times in gaming where we are really close. Like, VR is really close to being really accessible and really cool. It's not yet, but it's it's you can see the potential, right? I think that this is going to be the generation that makes or breaks companies. Yeah. yeah coming yeah. up. Yeah. And and I feel like there's also the whole cloud uh thing like google stadia and so i'm not sold on the idea so if it works then yes of course we don't know if it works because it's not in the hands of enough people i i will tell you my personal experience is sony did something similar with both ps3 and ps4 with a service where you could stream games Mm -hmm. and i will tell you now when was this uh, this is recently like they they, they've been doing sony's been playing with this for years Mm -hmm. with uh playstation it's got a weird name it's like playstation go now or something like that and it's all streaming older titles to your console and it's they they included they were including it in play uh, in in their 
in their PlayStation Plus Pass. And right. that was how I got to experience it with both my PlayStation 3 and my PlayStation 4. And I'm playing PlayStation 3 and 2 games on my console. And it's all streaming. And I'm playing a turn-based game. So I don't even need to be like actively playing. I, right. You know, and it was like, no, no, I pushed up. I pushed up. And I'm yeah. literally screaming at my TV. And I'm sure that things have gotten better. So this is, I mean, the exact opposite is what I'm reading on articles like The Verge. I'll have it linked in the show notes yeah. for anybody that's interested. And and the feedback there is that if, if, I mean, they're playing 60 frames a second, 1080p, Doom, Infer, Internal or Infernal or something. Uh, with the latest title from from the Doom franchise, which is a first person shooter, so so Twitch yeah. Twitch needed like it, it can't be laggy. If it la if it's yep. laggy, you die. Uh, and and they they um they were speaking with the person um representing Google Studio there at the conference, and they were like, no, the the server that you're playing on is not here. That's that's somewhere else at Google. It's in a data center. Uh, that's what they're saying, but I never believe them. Oh, well, see, I, at that point, like if they're lying, then that's just, they would never, they would end up eating their own foot. Like this, it would shoot them in the, in the, in the foot much faster than they'd like. I, I doubt that they're not being sincere about that. Uh, I, I mean, th this wasn't a competitive person to person match. This was just this guy playing the game. Right. But the fact that there's no lag and in input from, you know, you pulling a trigger and the gun shooting and all this kind of stuff uh is to me you know Im impressive uh yeah i i think the the thing that i find most appealing to it is that even though it's not a service like netflix it's not like you know 14 dollars a month watch whatever you want whenever you want there's a huge catalog yet what it is is uh you you pay i think it's the right now there's a there's a founder's pack where it's like 130 dollars and that gets you the controller, uh, which runs seventy dollars anyway, and then a Google Chromecast, I think, which is essentially yep. like a set top box. Uh, also, it's it's, it's it's literally a like a thumb drive size thing that plugs yeah into TV. plugs into your TV. So, but also they run around seventy dollars. So already you're at you're at you're paying for the hardware, you know, to yep. to get it in. Um, but then, you know, uh, you'll have three months of free free content uh, and a couple of games. And then, then after that, you know, you'll pay your ten dollars a month or something like that. And ten dollars a month is cheap. If it if, is, if but they you're can not deliver, getting, you're not getting what you. I don't think you're. What they're promising is not what you think you're getting for the ten bucks. No, but this is. The, uh, I haven't finished. You you don't get right. you don't get a Netflix. It's not a Netflix. That's what I'm trying to illustrate. Right. It's, it's not a Netflix thing. You still have to buy the game. Like if you want to buy play the latest Tomb Raider, if you want to play the latest Assassin's Creed, you got to spend the sixty bucks to play it on Stadia. Um, right. So it's it's a console that's not a console. So you don't have to drop right. the four hundred dollars, you know, on on the console to have it in your house uh, to to play the games locally. Uh, sorry, somebody on a motorcycle is going by. Uh, but it's one of those things where if it works the way that it says, then ten dollars is cheap compared to the investment of like buying the box and all the other stuff, because these other, these games that even if you buy a box, like even if you buy an Xbox for what, four or $500, whatever it is that you decide to do, you still often have to pay a 10 to $15 a month, like fee to play with your friends anyway. Like it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not like a PC where if you buy a game, that's an online game, like say, well, I mean, Fortnite's free, but like, that's a bad example. But if you, if you and I were to play uh, call of duty together, we would buy the game, we don't have to pay extra to connect our PCs to the internet and play no. them, right? And so what I thought was so interesting about Google Stadia is that it removes, it is the platform, but it removes the platform dependency of your hardware. What's connecting yes. to Google Stadia and communicating is the controller. And then the Google Chromecast is handling all of the display data. So I could play with Google Stadia like with without having to be uh on a on an xbox or a windows machine i could be i could play it on a mac like i the way that they they separate themselves from from being platform dependent is very interesting to me 
I don't know. No one knows if it's going to work because you are you have to have a decent internet connection. They say 30 megabits symmetrical, but like that to me seems slow. I would think you'd have to have a lot more than that, which I do. I, I have 100 megabits. Same. Right now. And I will tell you that even streaming Netflix on my TV, I was watching something yesterday and it was a hiccup. And next thing you know, I was getting a pixelated TV show for about five minutes. And I was like, okay, let's wait for this buffer to catch up. Yes. And I don't, I don't get that as often, but I, I know it, it's happened I don't before. E- I don't either, but I've been having it. I happen a lot lately with mm. several of my different shows. And I'm just like, what happens when this happens when I'm playing a game? Yeah. And I get this lag. Is it, it like, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of this games as a service kind of thing that a lot of game companies are doing right now you don't buy a game anymore you're buying a thing that we're promising you more content for the next six months to a year and then in a year we're going to put the sequel and we're going to abandon this completely and your game's not really going to work anymore yeah i mean and google is famous for when things don't work out they just kind of abandon it like it just, yeah. So there is there is that kind of thing. So I mean, I'm not going to be first in line for Google Stadia. Don't get me wrong. Um, but what no. I am looking forward to is I at think least you're... keeping the other people on their toes. Like Sony it... and Microsoft have to watch Google Stadia closely. If you're the if it works the way it says it does, you're their perfect use case. Mm-hmm. You're the person that should buy a Stadia. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, me, on the other hand. I got 1500 games on Steam. Well, yes. I don't. I like, 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 you got to convince me. Like, it's one of the reasons I, I would love to own a Switch. There's a, there's several games for Switch that I want. It isn't until this E3 that I've actually been come tempted to buy one because everybody keeps saying, yeah, well, there's this indie game. Yeah, no, no, no. I've been playing that game for five years. It's on Steam. I don't care that it's on Switch. I'm not buying it again. What else you got? And they go, oh yeah, here's the new Mario game. Okay, there's like five Nintendo games I want. What about uh, anything else? Well, what about this game? That's 10 years old. I've been playing that. I, I beat that already. I'm not looking to go back to that game. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's the, kind of what I see with, Steam, with with Switch. And I'm like, okay. And so I see Stadia, and they were they they listed all the titles that were going to be available for at launch with Stadia. And I was like, yeah, these are all games I either own already, or games I don't have interest in. Tell me what you're going to do for me that my PC gaming isn't going to do for me. And yeah. they haven't. Yeah. No. Well, and this and this is the thing. It's it's more of a. It's right now. It's more of a proof of concept. But it seems to be working when people do have hands on yeah. with it. Um, and and if anybody has the infrastructure to pull it off, I mean, the two companies that come to mind for me would be Amazon or Google. So, I mean, in terms of like servers and data centers yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So I'm at least curious to see see where it goes, the, especially if it gives me thing... access to games that I just, because I've had a really frustrating time lately with just like, oh, that looks like a lot of fun, but I don't have $400 for a new console, nor do I want to. Yeah. I don't want to commit that kind of cash into that, um, not a pigeonhole, but like that, that alleyway of, yeah. I then can only play console games on this particular platform because this is the platform I'm investing all my money in. And on top of that, like, I also don't know enough. Like I'm not, I mean, I sure I could do the research, but like, I'm not steeped in gaming. I like it, but I, I don't, it's not something that I, you know, eat, sleep, and breathe. And this is the thing that I do find that I'm finding that Google Stadia is getting a lot of raised eyebrows and not a lot of shade, but they're kind of like, eh, whatever, I'll, you know, this is not really, I don't see the appeal is what I hear a lot, like you said. But what I'm hearing that from is people that are hardcore gamers. And I'm like, well, you're not the target audience. Hardcore gamers no. are going to buy an Xbox. They already have a gaming PC and they're either going to buy PlayStation or Xbox, right. depending on where those titles are that they want to play, depending on who wins the console wars, those are what the hardcore gamers are going to buy. So I, I, I agree with you what you're saying. Yeah. My only thing is, is I don't know if there's enough casual people out there to buy this and pick it up to make it a viable business. So I don't think there's enough people out there that are going to drop the founders thing for $130. But when it's beyond that, when it is right. only 
a $10 a month investment, you know, or, or a drop of 70 bucks for the controller and then, and then a, a $10 a month investment, you know, in a world where people are willing to pay $14.99 for Netflix, which don't even get me started on how crappy Netflix content is right now in Canada. But like, I feel like the audience is there. I just don't think that they're loud. And I think that's the thing where it's like, we've all looked at gaming. We look, yeah, Xbox is cool, but like, I don't want to play Fortnite and I don't want to play Call of Duty. And that's what I understand that that that's, you know, that's what you just associate with it. Cause that's the level of your interest or, or the mm -hmm. level of your awareness, I should say. But once you get into things like, well, wait a minute, is this going to be really accessible for me? Like, it's one of those things that just has to be tested. And it, it could be something as simple as like, you know, one of your friends gets it, you go over, you play some games with them and you realize, oh crap, I can do this at home for a very small investment and a $10 thing a month. You know, like I'm about to cancel my Crave and HBO subscription, which was $20 a month because Game of Thrones is over. And I spent some extra time in HBO over the last few weeks watching some stuff that I didn't have access to, but I'm done now. So like that's 10 or $20 a month that I could really easily allocate to something else like gaming, which I would if, if, if this kind of thing I just was did available. the same thing, you know, like if this kind of thing was available, then I, I have that $10 a month. What I don't have is, you know, the extra income for, you know, for all the extra titles. Now, that is something that's important to note with Cydia, that it is not a Netflix thing. It, it, you do have to buy the titles. But at the same time, I also, I don't want more discs in my place. Like I don't want shelves and yep. shelves full of DVDs anymore like I used to. If I have to, if I'm paying $30 or $60 for a game and I can just download it and play it, or in Stadia, you don't even have to download it. You just, you get permission to play it and then you just play it. Um, I'm fine with that. That's, that's, you know, again, like we said, if, if the experience, um, is, is true now, I mean, I obviously move on, um, talk about titles and stuff like that. I really only happened to see two games that piqued my interest. Um, one of them is a quick mention. It's called Ori and the will of the wisps, which I think is a uh, sequel a sequel to Ori and the blind forest. And it looked They're gorgeous, beautiful. My it, goodness. It's a pretty game. The, 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 the Ori and the blind forest is just as gorgeous. Oh man! So uh, I've never I've never played them. Um, they're not sort of really my thing. Uh, I have a friend who swears by it and tells me that I would love it if I ever played it. I just it never gets down to a price point where I'm willing to risk it. It always is still like twenty bucks, and I'm always like twenty bucks for a risk. I'll wait till it's five, <laughs> and it never gets to five. But uh, but yeah, from what I can tell, it's like a it's a three three D or CG side scroller. So not like yep. necessarily not really a Mario, but it, it's that's the game. The gameplay is going to be platformy and and stuff like that. A lot of jumping around and you know avoiding your enemies and and getting around and stuff like that. But the the cuteness and the uh we'll say the zen quality to it uh and the imagination it is it's just spectacular to see yep. what they've done and you're this little kind of like ori character wispy thing and all of the battles that they showcased in the trailer or during the conference were these huge monsters that kind of come out of the background and fill the screen and it just it really felt dynamic and fun and all the kind of things that you wish games could have done when you were 12 and they do now and it, it seems like on top of being original and, and, and standing out in that way, it also just was not afraid to just be what it was, you know, like it's just, it's a platformer. Yeah. We're just, we're not going to pretend to be something. It's not a shooter. It's not a, this, we're not going to be trying to mesh, mesh three things together. It's not online. It's just, it's just, you just, you sit and you play it, <laughs> enjoy it, right. please, you know? And I, I really, really liked it. Uh, so that was kind of like the takeaway for me. Uh, the other one was uh, Avengers. The, the Avengers game looked cool. You don't really see a lot of gameplay. But like you said, there's some stuff. I think we're going to hear more about people that might have hands-on access um, on the gaming floor to, to hear back maybe on yes. podcasts and things. And, and I have some podcasts that I can recommend um, for people to listen to as well. But um, yeah, I. what did you think of the Avengers thing? Because that, that to me was appealing. Uh, the Avengers thing... It looks cool, but there wasn't enough gameplay for me to get excited. It made me go, okay, there's something cool that looks cool that's coming, and I, I, I want to play it, but my my gripe is is they're saying it, they're trying to make a Destiny-style game with the Avengers, and that sounds cool, but I'm also not a big fan of Destiny. I'm not... 
compelled to play a game that has that wants me to come back week by after week with my friends and do the same dungeons over and over and over again to grind for loot. That mm. that to me is boring. And that's what this sounds like they might be doing. They're promising a year's worth of content releases once the game comes out. And I go, okay, cool. But what's the content? Am I going to be grinding shields for Captain America and new helmets? Or energy beams for Iron Man's suit? Or, like, what am I getting? What is it that is going to keep me playing this for a year? And I, I, they haven't shown me the stuff that makes... But I ha, it, it, the story and the plot line looks cool. It's just a matter on whether or not they're going to deliver what I, what I want it to be. I would rather play just a, a narrative-focused game where you get to roll between the different Avengers. You know, like you can control the Hulk or control Iron Man or whatever. Like Might that. I suggest to you Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3, the Switch exclusive? Yeah, no, I've, se I've seen that as well. But <laughs> that, that kind of stuff, that, that kind of gameplay doesn't really appeal. You know, like the, the top-down yeah. sort of thing. Um, I, I much prefer the, the, the kind of gameplay that they showed. They showed, it was mostly in-game cinematic, but they did show what looked show, to be yeah. some gameplay. That is supposed to be in-game engine. Like that's not supposed mm. to be like yes, cut yeah. screen. That's supposed to be in, in-game CG. Yeah. I mean, uh, in-game graphics. Graphics. And that's cool, but that, and, and they looked really nice. But like I said, I'm, I'm holding my, I'm holding my excitement. I want to be excited about it. They just haven't shown me enough for me to be excited. Yeah, about it no, yet. I I agree. It just it's it was um, a little bit a little bit weird too. You kind of have to remind yourself the the MCU baggage that you bring because you're just like yeah. Captain America starts talking. You're like that doesn't sound like or look like Chris Evans. I'm out, and you're no. like no, no no no. I have to not be out. Like this is not the same thing. This is uh, the, uh, the comic universe. Give, you know the one thing I will give them credit for is almost every single one of the voice actors in that trailer are super famous voice actors that oh, yeah. have done major characters uh iron man is voiced by the guy that does nathan drake uh the the guy who does all uh that does a whole bunch of other major characters he's voicing um the hulk the, the the woman is a nut that's doing black widow is another i think she's a voice casting director or something right. like like they're all big 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 name people in the voice casting world so they didn't cheap out you're going to get good voice acting they're just not the celebrities from the movie yeah uh jeff shine is captain america laura bailey uh, yeah. no nolan north is tony stark iron stark, man yeah. Tra travis um willingham is thor uh, Troy Baker as Bruce Troy Banner. Baker. That's yeah. the one I was trying to remember. Yeah, I to me it was one of those things where like you know you talked about them trying to make a Destiny scale world, and that to me felt like where they might have been holding back because of the scale that they're trying to do. It looked good, but it didn't look fantastic. And I I yeah. know I know as I say that I know I'm absolutely regurgitating opinion that I heard on another podcast, but I felt the same way when I was watching. I was like. I kind of expected more. And I think this is the problem that I, I have with this E3 overall. My general takeaway with what I've been seeing, and it hasn't been a lot, but what I've seen is like, it's more of the same. Nothing looks groundbreaking uh, to me because it's, they don't, the next gen consoles have barely even been announced, let alone any it's, details given. It's funny because I've listened to several podcasts and there's a bunch of people that are like, I've never been this excited for E3. And I'm like, really? Like, yeah, are you watching wanna, the same I'm, A3? <laughs> are, you, are you watching the same thing as me? Because I, a Cyberpunk 2077, I'm excited for. But that's because six months ago, they showed in-game footage. Right. So when they showed that trailer, that was kind of giving me more about what the plot of the, of the story, the yeah. story was going to be. So that it makes sense. So the gameplay I saw six months ago, that in-game first-person footage, is them stealing whatever that chip is. And they go into this club, uh, and there's these gangbangers that are gonna that are trying to. There's supposed to be a deal going on. The guys double cross them, and then the guy shoots his way out of the bar. Hmm. And like at one point, his arm becomes a sword. He climb, cleaves some guy in half, and like it does all this really cool stuff. And I was like, okay, if this can deliver this to me in a story, I'm excited. The question is. How's the story? And then they showed the trailer and then they introduced Keanu Reeves in it. And I went, oh, okay. I'm officially more excited for this than I have been in the past. 
And it, it does it look cool. Said, it should say this. Keanu Reeves is not going to be a playable character, and he's not going to be your buddy that shoots alongside you. The rumor I've heard is from the show floor is he's the AI that talks to you. So he's like a digital representation that walks beside you and tells you where to go and what to do. Right. That's and cool. I'm like, I, I'm like, I like that better than him being the guy that's shooting alongside yeah. of me. I want to be in a buddy film with, with Ken. <laughs> that's, that sounds like fun. <laughs> I, the problem that the, the thing that I have from it, and this could be me just remembering it differently is that I thought when I first saw it last year, I think that it looked a lot more colorful, that it looked a lot, more uh, imaginative it, it, and it seems it's going to, have, to be and it seems to have gotten darker and more homogenized in the last it's, year it's, it's this it's where that demo was taking place right uh, okay. where that video for yeah. uh they've shown outdoor scenes where like you're strolling through the city and it's like walking through blade run which is grim <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, it was it was like Blade Runner during the day. Oh, so there okay. was still like neon lights and a sun over the sky, and then as like this thing, the night sky started to show show as the guy was walking down the street, and then things became like Blade Runner. So it, yeah. it, it, it it's it, it, it's not going to be totally grim. Yeah, it is going, but it is going to be semi post apocalyptic. Yeah, well, it's kind of like um, uh, Mass Effect. Mass Effect had some planets where it was very bright and white and blue yep. and shiny, and then other planets were just red and black and just like yep. dust, you know, yep. and carnage and stuff like that. So yeah, I just yeah. I mean, we, again, we don't know enough about it. I mean, it's a cool idea. It's it's a it's a massive undertaking, and and again, they've pushed that date. They'd never announced a date, I don't think, before. But the fact that it's not coming out for yet another year, uh, I again, I'm I. I have I have no real investment in it, so I'm happy that if they're pushing it back, it does sort of feel with so many titles being talked about for so long that are now coming out in like 2020. It kind yeah. of feels like the industry might be at least listening to to a lot of the the talk that's out there about overworking people and having expectations that are beyond what's what should be, you know, respectful in terms of a working yeah. environment. And because um, I. I like video games, but I hate the idea that I'm enjoying something that someone really, really didn't enjoy making. Like because yeah. they were working 60, 80 hour weeks and they were being away from their family and stuff like that. That bothers me. So um, I'm happy to see that. I, I mean, I would much rather wait for better games. I would much yes. rather wait. I agree with you. You know, to have things, you know, done. I also think that there's a certain you know, PR schedule that I think some studios feel like they have to stick to and really just, you can say nothing about your game until it's going to be ready in six months. And that's fine by me. Like I would, I don't, I don't need to know about it 18 months these, ahead of time. I, I am of the personal opinion. I think these companies spend way too much on PR. Mm -hmm. I think if you create a good game and give me a year to get excited for it and show it to me and say, Hey, in a year, but this is how far along we are. Look at this. And they can show me something that looks like a semi-coherent project. And it's something I'm interested in. That's enough to sell me. You don't need to put a poster in every mall in America. It's, you don't... You, you, like, it's... It, I don't need an ad. You don't need to buy the storefront of, of every gaming thing I'm clicking on to buy games. It, it, that... that yeah. Why waste the money? I saw. Just I saw. Show me a good trailer. I saw three building size billboards for Doom, in yep. in a in a in a photo online. I was like, my God, just pay the Bethesda people that are making the Bethesda burns through money. Oh my God, Bethesda burns it's, through so much it's money. Just ridiculous. Like, and I got news for you: all the nerds that play these video games, they're not outside. <laughs> they're not, they're, they don't care about nope. billboards. Hit, nope. them, hit them with a Facebook ad, you know, <laughs> like it's just anyway. Yeah. I just, I mean, I mean, I think we'd probably have to wrap it up and, and move on. But uh, I mean, if you, for those of you that have stuck with us and listened to an indie gamer and a non gamer talk about E3, <laughs> I, I appreciate uh, the, the ear time. Uh, but I yeah, mean, I, it's the, it, the, go the ahead. One game, other game I want to say that I'm, 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 I really am curious about is Watch Dogs Legion. Uh, I, I wanted to like the first Watch Dogs. In it, in it, in it was okay. And then Watch Dogs Two, I 
just there wasn't enough good talk about it, but there wasn't a lot of bad talk. It got really middling reviews, and I went, I I got burned on the first one. I don't want to play the second one. If the uh, but what they're promising with Watch Dogs Legion is that there is no main character. When the game begins, you literally will go around the city of London and pick three random people on the street, and they will be your heroes, and then they will recruit more people, and you will end up with a squad of 20 random people from London as your heroes. You can even recruit old ladies and make them mug people. I'm like, I'm like, this sounds cool. <laughs> and everybody is supposed to have their own voice actor and the awesome. But can you deliver this? Yeah. This sounds too big to deliver for me. Yeah, like, a little bit too good to be true. Very interesting though. I I, d- I did see that that it's an trailer. interesting idea, and it makes me want to be excited. I want to run around the city of London trying to take down the man and 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 free the city from, from from lockdown. That sounds cool to me, but can you deliver on all the other promises? Mm-hmm. And so far, Ubisoft, you have not. So <laughs> I remain optimistic, but not until I see more. But I, it, it's it's like everything else with this. I've gone. Ooh, sounds good. Can you pro- can you deliver on your promise? But uh, but uh, I speak from someone who covered video games for a few years, and they always promise you things, and then they always you always have to dial back your expectations, and uh, and, and it's made me very jaded when it comes to this. <laughs> so that's why when I look at this stuff, I always go, I always go, yeah, but that's what you're saying, but how much is PR and how much is what you're really gonna give me? Yeah. Well, speaking of expectations, uh, the one thing that I have not checked out yet that is on Crave for me here in Canada is Doom Control because I have mixed expectations. <laughs> but I, I know that you've been watching. So what what do you think of, of Doom Patrol? Uh, best DC show on TV. No kidding, really? Um, It is like an episode of uh, Seinfeld mixed with superheroes mixed with like they constantly screw up and then try to fix the screw up and they never they never know what the hell they're doing someone always messes something up and it, you laugh as much as that you feel like they're being heroes well, that's and good because I, so I don't like Seinfeld, but I like superheroes. So I'm kind of 50, 50. I'm still kind okay. of only one, right. one toe all right. in. All right. Okay. All right. So you saw that uh, episode of, of Titans, Titans where yes. they introduced that. Yep. Uh, they recast the chief. It's now played by Timothy Dalton instead of the other guy with the beard that was supposed to be in charge of them. So chief was like the, the doctor dad. He's guy? the doctor, that guy that t- sort of takes care of them all. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 And what you end up finding out is their villain is played by Alan Tudyk. And he's a guy named Mr. V- Mr. Nobody. And they, he's the narrator of the episodes. And Mr. Nobody is like, what are these losers going to do this week? Or, uh, and, 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 and he's kidnapped the chief. And that's the plot of the entire season. Is you're trying to figure out where the chief is and how they can get him back. Okay. And when they consult with other people that are, like, involved in superhero business, like, Cyborg joins them at some point. And Cyborg is throughout the whole series. But when they talk to Cyborg's dad, they're like, yeah, this guy can't know, called Mr. Nobody, uh, he's got, like, godlike powers and he kidnapped the chief. And Cyborg's dad's like, yeah, but the, 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 I talked to the Justice League. They don't know who this Mr. Nobody is. He can't be anybody if, if the Justice League doesn't know who he is. And they're like, yeah, but that's because he doesn't want the Justice League. And they're like, no. And they're like, no, he is. He kidnapped the chief. He's just doing this to pester us. And they're like, and it's Cyborg's dad's like, you're a bunch of loops. And you're like, like, like it, 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 it's just, it's quirky. Um, the, the, the two new heroes that have joined them that were not in the Titans episode is Crazy Jane. She has 64 personalities. And all of them have different superpowers. <laughs> Good lord. And so she gets mad, and this one called Hammerhead takes over, and her power is she's super strong, and she just starts throwing stuff. Then this other one is like 
uh, just burns things to the ground. So they have to constantly like, where's Jane? Oh shit, there's another pa- personality. Oh, which one is it this week? And like, then they gotta go stop Jane from burning down the town because they're mad at the town's mad at her. And like, it, 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 it's it's just nonsense for 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 sixty minutes every episode, and it's only twelve or thirteen episodes. Uh, I was, I marathon the entire thing in like one sitting. Hmm. That's how that's how much I enjoyed it. Um, every character gets every all of them have their own garbage to deal with. Right. Uh, like, and each episode sort of tackles them as, as heroes. Like, uh, the robot man is trapped inside a robot body, and he's trying to deal with the fact he's never going to feel or touch anything anymore. And it's not like in the in in the episode of Titans where he's asking everybody what their meal tastes like. Right. He does do that a little bit, but it's more like he wants to identify with people and he can't anymore. And he wants to go out in public, but he's kind of ashamed that he, that people are going to look at him and be like, who are you? And sometimes when he goes places, they're like, what superhero are you? And he's like, I'm the robot man. <laughs> and they're like, uh-huh. What do you do? And he's like, I'm a robot. <laughs> like, 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 like it, it's quirky. At one point, he gets a squirrel living inside his suit and it like starts ripping wires out and he starts going haywire and starts feeling all these emotions he wasn't feeling before. <laughs> and it's like, like, and you're it, like it, the whole episode, I'm like just explaining bit things that like are like 10 minute segments of the episode. Right. So it's but, a little bit, but, a little bit more like a cartoon than, yeah. Than the and, other and, DC shows. Yeah. And the, and the other guy, um, the negative man, the guy that's wrapped in bandages, uh, his character all of them are old and they make a point of highlighting that as the show goes on. Uh, Negative man has been around since the, he was a test pilot in the fifties. Right. And whatever it is that's done to him, he's not aging. Uh, But he's also horribly scarred underneath all those bandages and they don't, and he can't heal and he's two people. There's a thing living inside of him. But they also tie that into his character was in the 50s and his cut scenes where they cut back to the 50s. He was a gay man in the 50s trying to live a fake life with a wife and kids. Okay. So there's and there so is some depth to it. There's depth to it. Where like his story is the bo- thing living inside his body is trying to tell him to be him. But he's still living in that 50s mentality where he can't be out and in the open. Right, and then, because of that's and, when he was brought up, right? Yeah, and then he'll start to dip into the like, oh, he's kind of cute, and then, then something will happen. He'll be like, no, you cannot do that. It's not right. And like, there's this, there's this. His character ends up saving the day a bunch, but there's also this thing where you're like, he's torn between two worlds. Mm. The actress chick, she's kind of caught up in herself, and she sometimes gets too caught up in herself. Crazy Jane is just crazy and has too many personalities and she's trying to organize them and keep them in control so that she can just be herself. And sounds, sounds like a lot of like D and D type characters, you know, like chaotic good. And yeah. And, it, like... it, and, and, and there's a lot going on. And in the meantime, the chief has his own episodes where like there's two or three episodes where it's just the chief telling a backstory about something that happened. And you're like, Oh, okay. Uh, the only thing I will say is it wraps up in a nice neat bow, sort of. There's kind of an open end where like you can go, oh, if this is where they end it, okay, you got an answer to all your big questions, but there's a leading plot that could go forward. Uh, but sounds it, like a good way to end a first season. It it does, uh, and it as far as I know, it has been renewed for a second season, which I was really excited for. But literally, Alan. Oh, the other character I should say that's introduced. Is they introduced Danny Street? Are you familiar with the DC character uh, Danny Street? No, I don't know who any of these people are. Okay, Danny <clears throat> Street is a living street that floats, and just next thing you know, Danny Street is living in New York City, and all the people Danny picks up people that are like rejects and people that people don't want or people don't like or that weird looking guy down the street danny picks him up and goes it's okay we're all acceptable and he picks people up and like brings them with him as he just kind of like disappears and reappears someplace else uh because there's people hunting danny and the doom patrol ends up having to protect help and protect danny 
and it's like another whole arc of the storyline. Everything is really neat and interesting. You're, there's never a dull moment. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't sound predictable. You know, it's because a lot not of not in any way, shape, or form. A lot of other like classic superhero like shows, there seems there always seems to be that kind of like that arc. You know, that the the hero yep. the hero story arc that everybody has to follow, regardless of what their powers are. The, the underlying arc is usually the same. So that's it's interesting. I mean, it's on my list. This is one of those things where like I just haven't been in the mood for. It. It's like similar to your, you know, your the the games that you mentioned earlier. It's like twenty dollars for a risk. For me, it's like, oh, do I have an hour to take a risk on this? <laughs> you know, that's, I would that's say, kind of like where I am. I would say, give yourself the pilot. If you don't enjoy the pilot, you won't enjoy the rest of the series. Okay, well, that's fair enough. It, um, it, it's good that it stays true. Like, because sometimes it, with these shows, it, there's a duck and run. Like, there's a there's a, a fake out. You know. You literally just keep getting more of what that first episode is every episode after. Right. So if you don't like the sense of humor, you don't like the quirkiness that it's portraying in the first episode. Um, there was a couple of plot points that didn't hit. They do a plot point with the robot guy and he finds out he may have family still alive and he goes to try and find them. And that was kind of hit or miss. Some of it was funny. Some of it wasn't. Some of it was entertaining. Some of it wasn't. Like this, like all good shows, there's not you're not gonna love every episode, but I enjoyed every character so much that I just was like, okay, this episode or this plot in the episode for this character didn't work for me, but the other two characters that had a plot that worked for me. Nice. Okay. You know. Cool. I will. I will put it on the on the watch list because again, like I've only got, I think I've only got about a week left before, um, Crave kicks out. So. I'll have to uh, I'll have to dive into that because I certainly have enough time. Uh, yeah. For me, I actually I have a book to recommend. I Ooh. I haven't really been watching much. I've been trying to get into stuff. It's been a lot of stuff that I tried to watch and had to bail. Um, I was poking fun at Blade Runner earlier. I tried to watch the new Blade Runner movie. It is boring. Could not sit through more than a half an hour at a time. And after three watch sessions and realized I'm only halfway through the movie, I was like, nope, <laughs> I'm out. See ya. Uh, yeah. I tried a bunch of other things. I am enjoying The Last Kingdom on Netflix, but I'm only three or four episodes into the final season of that or the third season of that. And it's good, but again, like it just it seems to be very slow where it's an hour long drama and I'll pause it to get up and won't come back to it and I'm only halfway through an episode. So I'm only watching it mm -hmm. like a half an hour at a time. And I don't know why that is, because it's not bad. It's just that it's it's for whatever reason is not something that is keeping pace with me um, because it has been so nice that I've also been trying not to spend a lot of time in front of screens. And uh, I've been meaning to read this book for a long time. It's uh, practical demon keeping by Christopher Moore. Christopher Moore is actually a favorite author of mine. Uh, I haven't read a lot of his stuff, but what I have read, I've very much enjoyed. Uh, he's funny for uh, a novelist. They're, they're very they're kind of like a dark humor to a lot of, a lot of his work. Uh, he has got other books like Lamb, the Gospel According to Biff, which is a, a story about um, what if there was a 13th apostle? And it's like, it's it's the story of Christ and his 13-year-old buddy between the ages of 13 and 30. And it's like, the whole idea is that if you're the son of God and you're a teenager, you kind of have some fun with that. <laughs> like, So he's mm -hmm. that it's that kind of edge walking that he does with his humor. Um, the other one that I really like is called a dirty job. And that's about a guy that has to take on the job of a grim reaper and raise his toddler <laughs> at the same time. Mm. Um, and this is, this is, uh, an earlier book. This was from 1992. So it's dated in, in that not only the world that it's set in is like pre cell phone everywhere. Um, yeah. but it's also, uh, just in terms of Moore's style and the character archetypes that he uses in this book you can sort of see it in his later writing in much better forms. Not that this is bad, but if you're familiar at all with Christopher Moore, then this is going to immediately kind of strike you as a, huh, this feels weird. And then you go and real look and you go, Oh, it's because it's like 30 years old, uh, you know, but, but it is a really good book and it's about uh, Travis. What's Travis's last time? Oh, Hearn. Uh, and he is the keeper of catch who is a demon uh, from the days of Solomon. And uh, Christopher Moore plays with the idea of heaven, earth, angels, demons, hell, and the fact that this demon has been on earth and Travis is immortal 
and the demon is both uh, a curse and a gift because it keeps Travis alive. It, um, it protects him and can get him all kinds of things. It means that he hasn't really had to want for anything, but it also means that he has to deal with a demon that kills people and does demony things. And um, Catch is essentially, uh, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to think of like what Hollywood kind of character that I have in my head whenever Catch speaks in the book. And did you ever see, um, oh, what's the name? The, the Troll Hunter. Did you ever watch those cartoons? Yep. So yep. the little baby troll that ends yep. up being their friend, the guy that talks like he's from Jersey. Yep. That's what I think of when I think about Catch. Because he's supposed to be about that size when he's not eating people. Uh, yeah. And, and he's got that kind of like snarky, sarcastic, I'm older than the earth, kind of like, I know better than you, but I'm also a demon enslaving to you and I have to do what you say, so I'm going to do it anyway. But even though I'm going to do it, I'm going to be a sarcastic teenager <laughs> while I do it. So there are some very, very funny moments between Travis and Catch. Uh, but I would say the first two chapters really kind of set the stage for... Um, uh, a drug dealer, a door-to-door salesman, a drunk photographer, a bait and tackle shop owner, and all of the local yokels that live in this quirky little town called Pine Cove, which is where the whole thing is set. And what I love about what Moore does with the characters is that more often than not, all the characters in Pine Cove are connected. And he doesn't hit you over the head with it. In some cases, you don't get the connections until like the last couple of chapters. And in some cases, they're not connected at all until they actually cross paths in the book where like, you know, the cop and this other person finally meet, even though they've been chasing the same, you know, clues for the whole story. They've never actually touched one another or, or crossed paths. But, um, but you as a reader find out how they're related in some way and blah, blah, blah. But it's very, very um, light reading. It's it's uh, it's just a fun, fun, quirky book. And there's the thing about it that I think really um, grabbed me was uh, Augustus Brine is one of the main characters, and he plays the guy that runs the um, uh, Gus's Bait Tackle and Fine Wines, <laughs> which, like as you can imagine, uh, is just an odd combo. And that's the level of humor that you get throughout this whole thing is that everything's just a little bit quirky you know like there's there's the the mom and pop diner but it's run by some guy that talks like he's from shakespeare like it's it's just there's just these little quirks everywhere it sort of reminds me of all of the ancillary characters from gilmore girls Mm -hmm. in a in a good way not in an annoying way uh they're they're colorful they're quirky but they're not they don't kind of get on your nerves like they don't repeat themselves and they don't they don't have a predictability to them, but they certainly have a type to them. Where like you've seen this type of character in a film or you know movie right. before, like the three old guys that sit in the bait and tackle when it opens at seven o'clock and have coffee and they talk about all the other people in the town and they just you know they're always super polite to everybody when they see them in person. But the three of them there, you know, in the window, are always talking shit. Like just, you've seen that type in different movies before, right? Um, he takes tropes and he makes them more interesting. Than they yeah, are. very much so. Yeah. And the whole idea, the whole thing, sort of feels like a. It feels like a nineteen nineties horror thriller like it feels like a well you know what it does it feels like a um uh, stranger things like that's that's the kind of level of of nostalgia and kind of like tropes but in a good way that it mm-hmm. has um but yeah so i i highly recommend it it's a very easy read uh and uh, and if you like it then i would check out some of the other stuff that he's done i really like a dirty job and um i also have heard that the a follow-up see this is the other thing that more does is that sometimes the characters in his books show up in in other other books books. so like there is a demon in lamb and i think it's catch like i think the idea is that it's supposed to be the same demon i don't know if they ever name him but the characteristics when i read 
practical demon keeping seems so familiar. I was like, hmm. Yeah. An imp sized demon that gets to be three and a half meters tall when it becomes an eating form and can be visible to people. It's like, that sounds really familiar. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same sort of thing. Uh, there's also another one called the Lust Lizard of Melancholy Cove. And I think that Melancholy Cove is part of or a nickname for Pine Cove. So I'm curious about that book now because I think some of the characters that I like from it's the sequel to it's the sequel to the one you've is it okay. Read. So I'm again it's, like it's, I'm I'm not quite uh, steeped in this three books. There's three books in the series. I'm looking at it on Amazon right now. Okay, what's the other one? Uh, hold on, I'm looking. Uh, the lizards thing is. Um, Thank you. Go to the, give me. It's book two, right? And then the third book is the stupidest angel, right? Okay, so I've, I have heard of that one, but when I read the back of that in the bookstore one time, I was like, okay, this sounds like it's part of a much larger series. So I, I knew that that wasn't the right one to pick up, like on its own. Um, yeah, but yeah. So anyway, I I would highly recommend it. It's it is a it's just a fun light summer read. You've just added a added a bunch of books to that I, I that i'm going huh <laughs> now with that money i'm gonna save from amazon from uh, from hbo there you go maybe i need to resub to auto audible yeah i'm actually quite curious because all of christopher moore's book i've read old-fashioned like on a park bench paperback um i've not done the audiobook thing for any of his books i'm curious as to whether or not um whether or not uh, this would be, would be a dirty good. job is read by fisher stevens Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, the actor and uh, uh, the other one you mentioned earlier is read by uh, uh, Oliver Wyman. Uh, he's read several audio. He's he's a big audiobook reader guy, and okay. I, I know that I know he read Anath Anathem. Okay. Which I which I which was a long time ago. Cool. And I I listened to that. Right on. And he's a good, he's a really good narrator. Well, we will have links to uh, this book, uh, Doom Patrol, as well as uh, a lot of the other stuff that we talked about uh, during E3 in the show notes. You can find those over at thecitadelcafe.com. You can always email the show. Let us know what you're looking forward to on E3, from E3, excuse me. Uh, that's at thecitadelcafe at gmail.com. The show music was composed by Kevin McLeod. You can find us by name on Twitter and Facebook. And of course, you can subscribe on all of your favorite podcasting platforms like iTunes, Android, Stitcher, and Spotify. If you'd like to support the show, then you can do that over at The Citadel Cafe uh, on Patreon. And uh, it's one of the best ways to actually keep the show going. We have had some fluctuation here and there in the last little while. My goal is always to have one more patron per month uh, than we had the month before. We're actually up to 18. I got it wrong last month. I think I might have said it was it was 17, but we're up to 18. So looking for number 19 before the end of June. And if that's you, then just head on over to patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe and become a member. Uh, it's totally up to you. There's a bunch of different benefits from different levels, uh, things like bonus episodes. Uh, there's roles in the Discord. Access to the Discord is a big thing. That's where Lou and myself and some other friends hang out and talk about this kind of stuff. Um, all week long, really. Uh, lots of Lego talk uh, and a new, a newly minted food channel where we're sharing recipes and things like that. So that's the kind of stuff that you can expect. So uh, check it out, patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. My name is Joel Duggan. Everything that I'm doing online is at joelduggan.com. That includes my illustration and design portfolio. You can also check out my other podcast, The Spawn Chunks, at thespawnchunks.com. It's all about Minecraft. And we will have lots to say about Minecraft Dungeons as well as Minecraft Earth on the next episode. And actually, I want to point out this latest episode. We recorded it earlier this week on Monday. We had Adam Clark on the show. Adam is a professional Minecrafter that works in the education space. Uh, so we had an interview with him on the show. It was a very different kind of episode for us, but it was really cool to talk to Adam. And most people kind of shrug Minecraft off as like digital Lego and just kind of like a sandbox play space. But uh, Adam was really articulate in explaining the ways that he and other members of teams that he's worked with have used Minecraft to raise awareness about uh, the environment, about endangered species, about social and leadership skills. And because it's generally uh, a game that's appealing to young people, it kind of breaks down those barriers and kids end up learning and they don't really realize that they're learning in the first place. Uh, so worth worth a listen. I, I really thought it was it was cool of Adam to take the full the full hour to hang out with us. So that's over at uh, thespawnchunks.com. Everything that I do, I'm going to point you right now towards Twitch. I'm doing a lot of uh, streaming video stuff, mostly Minecraft, but I also do some art too. Lou, where can people find you and all the cool stuff that you're doing online? 
easiest place to find me is on my podcast, Zombies at My Podcast, where right now we are deep in Fear the Walking Dead. And I have to say, if you hate regular Walking Dead, like I sort of do, uh, Fear the Walking Dead is different. It's bright. There's kind of a happy future. There's kind of there's villains, <laughs> but they're not just shitting all over you all the time. You can relate <laughs> to the bad guys. It's amazing. It's, it's, nice. what, it's what zombie content should be. You've been listening to the Citadel Cafe where we are fast, easy, and cheap, but you can only pick two.